Well, we are doing a study in the book of Revelation. If this is your first time or first time in a long time, welcome to North Shore. This summer, it's our privilege to go through this timely book. If you want to understand what God is doing, how all things are going to end, and what we're facing today, we're not just reading about Revelation, folks. We're in Revelation. And we're seeing that the things that are predicted there are coming true today. We're in chapter 10 tonight, or this morning, and I want to invite you to join with us as we continue in this study. Today, we're going to look at the Apostle John's assignment to warn people about the impending judgment of God. Chapters 10 and 11 are right at the center, the heart of Revelation for a reason. It's because they reveal something very important about our God. These two chapters, 10 and 11, may appear to be digressions from the seven trumpet plagues, but they are not digressions. It's not, it's just an interlude. It's not that it's uh, off on a different subject or tangent. Chapters 10 and 11 contain two scenes that happened before the last trumpet sounds, the seventh trumpet. The first of these two scenes involves the assignment that was given to John. He's the author of the book of Revelation. That's chapter 10. The second scene involves the assignment given to two mystery witnesses. And we'll look at those next week in chapter 11. Why are these two scenes, chapter 10 and 11, given? Well, it's because they emphasize that God does not act in judgment without first giving warning. That's the whole purpose of the trumpet plagues. What do trumpets do? Well, they sound an alarm. That's how they were used in the ancient world. They give a warning. Each of the trumpets, the seven trumpets, serve as a warning to humanity to repent, to get right with God before it is too late. Now, if you'll remember, just by way of review, the seven trumpets, the first four trumpets sound a warning by natural means against the earth and skies. It talks about hailstones and crops being destroyed and sea life, a third of the sea life being destroyed. It talks about tainted water with wormwood. It talks about eerie darkness. Whereas the fifth and sixth trumpets sound a warning by unnatural means. If you remember from last week, those of you who were with us, it talked about demonic swarms of locusts that sting and make people miserable. In fact, they want to die, but they can't for five months. And then it also talked to the sixth trumpet about a demonic calvary of 200 million that only go after those who do not have the mark of God on their foreheads. And then, now in chapters 10 to 11, we're given two additional warnings. One in chapter 10 and one in chapter 11. Each of these scenes represent a warning by God, again, to repent, to get your life right with God before it's too late. The lesson, I want to emphasize this, the lesson is God does not act in judgment without first giving a warning. God doesn't destroy without warning. That is who God is. And that is what God does. This is what God did before the flood came in Genesis chapter 6. For those of you who are aware and remember what the Bible teaches there. He appointed Noah to be a preacher of righteousness, to tell others, to warn others. 2 Peter 2.5 tells us about that mission that Noah had. And he gave a humanity. Do you remember how long he gave humanity to repent before the flood came? 120 years. Yeah. 120 years to repent before the earth was destroyed by water. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Now, let me ask you this. Did humanity repent? No. But did God give ample warning? Yes, because that's the nature of God. He warns before he destroys. Through the prophets, let's think about Israel's story. Through the prophets, God gave warning after warning after warning for the Jewish people to repent or their nation would be destroyed. Did Israel repent? No. Sadly, no. But did God give ample warning through prophets like Jeremiah, Amos, and Joel? Yes, yes. But they didn't respond. 
God warns through the prophets. And the Apostle John, this is how you need to view John, the Apostle, he is God's appointed prophet for the New Testament. Now, this tells us something important about our God. He is a God who prefers mercy over judgment. That is in keeping with his very heart. He prefers mercy over judgment. The Bible tells us very clearly that God is a God of love. Thank goodness he is. 1 John 4, 8 and verse 16. 1 John chapter 4. God is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. We must not forget that. And really, when you think about it, thank goodness he is a God of justice. That means corruption will not always win. Evil will not always prevail. Ultimately, there's going to be a day of accountability, a day of justice. Judgment, when we talk about God's judgment, is simply God's righteous execution of justice. But before judgment comes, God warns. And that's what he's going to do in the two scenes that we're going to be looking at in chapters 10 and 11. That's why there's this interruption, as it were, between the sounding of the sixth trumpet and the sounding of the seventh trumpet. We have these two interludes here, these two scenes where God gives warning. And they teach us that warning comes before judgment because here's the heart of God. 2 Peter 3.9 tells us, God does not want any to perish but for all to come to repentance. All means all. And so he gives warning after warning, wake up. But do we listen to that warning? I believe in many ways 9-11 was a warning to our nation when those twin towers fell. Planes ran right into them in, in the Pentagon. A wake up. But did we respond? No. Have we changed our ways? No. I think the pandemic, in some ways, the recent pandemic we've had, was a wake-up call, not only to our nation, but worldwide. But have we responded? Has the world changed its ways? Sadly, no. We don't. Nothing less than the outstretched arm of God, the personal intervention by Jesus Christ, will change and bring all things into submission under God. Only the direct intervention by God will bring that about. But still God warns. So let's look at these two final warnings that will be given to the planet Earth. This week we'll look at scene number one, the assignment that was given to the Apostle John. And next week we'll look at the scene number two, which is the assignment given to the two witnesses in chapter 11. But first, let's begin with the angel's declaration. In chapter 10 of Revelation, we're given perhaps the most complete, thorough, description of any angel found in the Bible. In fact, some have thought, well, what we're we'll seeing here in chapter 10 is Jesus Christ, but it's not Christ. It's described specifically as an angel. But notice the description we're given. No other angel is given this complete of a description. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. I saw another strong angel, so it's an angel. It's not Jesus. Coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, And the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had had in his hand a little book, a scroll, which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. Imagine this roar. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder, this long, continuous sound, uttered their voices. And when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, John says, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which which the seven peals of thunder have spoken and do not write them. Wow, what's going on here? Well, let's find out. Let's dive into a little bit. Notice what we're told about this mighty angel here in chapter 10 of Revelation. First of all, he is described as a strong angel from heaven. So he is an angel created by God, with great authority from God. Great authority is what is emphasized. He is clothed with a cloud. Now, I would submit to you, don't think of nice little fluffy white cumulus clouds, you know, that go floating by in the sky. Think of a storm. And what the message is, is a storm is coming. 
a storm of epic proportions. And what happens after a storm, a rainstorm happens? A rainbow comes out. And so we read third, he has a rainbow on his head, symbolizing great power and beauty and wonder. The rainbow, if you know anything about the Bible, represents God's promise to once never again destroy the earth by water. Never again. It's a promise that God made. It's a gift from God. Today, as most of you are aware, the LGBTQ plus community uses the rainbow to represent its movement. Perhaps the rainbow banner is the most recognized banner in the world today. It's international. It's come upon us in its force and prevalence in just the last few years. What you may not be aware, and this is important, that the ancient Babylonian goddess Ishtar, if you're taking notes, write down the name Ishtar. Look her up. Babylonian goddess of immorality, of sex, and war, Ishtar, was often depicted as riding on a rainbow, coming to conquer. Now, I want you to contrast that to the angel here. He is under the rainbow. The rainbow is on his head, meaning he is under the authority of God and submission to God. Ishtar was depicted as riding a rainbow, coming to influence and conquer. Now, I know that many people, when they show the rainbow colors, the banner, have no idea of this. But there are ancient pagan powers behind this. The rainbow is not just simply a nice symbol of coalition. They chose the colors, and the colors aren't even the true colors of an actual rainbow. There's, There's history behind this. Ishtar, this Babylonian goddess of immorality and war, was depicted as riding on a rainbow. And if you want to know more about this, I want to encourage you to read Jonathan Kahn's book, The Return of the Gods. It talks about how some of the ancient practices, the pagan practices of old, are coming back today. And again, most people, when they show their rainbow banner, have no idea the association, but it is there. And we need to be aware of that. Now, let's go on to describe that angel. He has a face that shines like the sun, emphasizing God's glory. He has feet like pillars of fire, emphasizing power and strength, great power and strength. And he has a little book in his hand, which was open. And this scroll, this book, is open means that it was meant to be understood. It reveals the final events of human history. The open book means it is meant to be understood. Now, I want you to notice the position of this angel. It's very important. He has his right foot on the sea. He has his left foot on the land. Not just land, but the land. I submit to you, if you position yourself in orientation to Israel, this angel is looking upon the land of Israel, specifically Jerusalem. Right foot on the Mediterranean Sea, left foot on the land, the land of Israel. Why is he focused on Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem is the center of God's redemptive plan as a location. It's the place where Jesus gave his life and died on the cross for our sins. It's the place that Jesus is going to return and reign as Lord of lords and King of kings forever. Jerusalem is at the very heart of God's redemptive plan. And so the angel is orientated toward Jerusalem. And a storm is coming. A storm of epic proportions. That brings us now to the last description. Notice that the angel speaks with a loud voice, a booming voice, the voice of a roar of a lion. And he is answered by seven peals of thunder, echoing booms. They must have communicated something, these booms, because John was ready to write down their message. But remember that the the angel said, don't write it down. And so John didn't, or seal it up at least, seal it up. And what this tells us that there are some mysteries we'll never know this side of heaven. Wouldn't you like to know what John heard and recorded? But he was told to seal them up. So we'll just have to wait to heaven to find out. 
Now, this mighty angel, powerful in submission to God, has a message. And this message is very important. Let's look at it. In verses 5 through 7, John continues to write, Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and on the land, the land, Israel, lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and the earth in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it. That's a quote from Exodus 20, verse 11. And there will be, and here's the message, there will be no delay no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, which he is about to sound, the seventh trumpet, then the mystery of God is finished, completed, as he preached to his servants, the prophets. Now, notice three things. First, notice the raising of the right hand to heaven. Folks, this is how formal oaths were given at once upon a time. Remember that? Some of you remember when you were as a witness and you're called into a court of law, you'd have to raise your right hand and you'd often have to place your left hand on a Bible. I don't think they do that anymore. And they would swear, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. A formal oath is what we have depicted here. This indicates that this angel is giving a promise that is going to happen because it is coming from God. It is from God himself that is giving this. And what is the promise? What is the message? The promise and the message is no more delay. You think, well, delay to what? There will be no more delay to God's final judgment when God himself will act and avenge and make all things right This is an answer to the martyr's question in Revelation 6.10. To look back on the Revelation 6, chapter 6, verse 10, the martyrs are seen underneath the altar of God, and they're crying out, How long, O Lord, how long before you avenge our blood? How long? And the answer is no more delay. Now, folks, God is a patient God, but there comes a time when he must act. And this is that time depicted in this vision. The angel announces very clearly there will be no more delay. The time for God to act is now. That brings us now to the third point, the mystery. The mystery of God, the angel said, is finished. It is completed, verse 7. Now the word mystery refers to something that was hidden but now revealed. Progressively, the redemptive plan, that's the mystery, the redemptive plan of God was revealed by the prophets of old and then fulfilled by Jesus himself. God's redemptive plan doesn't just involve Jesus coming the first time and giving his life for us there on the cross so he could set us free from the penalty of sin and also so we can experience freedom from the power of sin, which we can today, But it also, the redemptive plan, involves Jesus coming a second time and delivering us from the very presence of sin, making all things right. That's what is going to be finished. That is what is going to be completed. So no more delay means the time for God to act is now. And this brings us now to John's commission, John's assignment in verses 8 through 11 of Revelation chapter 10. Notice, then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, here's the message, go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land, again, facing Jerusalem. So I went to the angel telling them to give me, telling him to give me the little book. I can just imagine little John going to this giant angel and said, can I have that scroll please? And he, the angel said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, that is, digested it, swallowed it, my stomach was made bitter. And they, that is, the angel, said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples, many nations, and tongues, and kings, Well, let's look at some observations here. 
Notice, first of all, that G- John, John the, the author of this book of Revelation, is instructed to eat the scroll. Now, consuming the scroll makes, means or symbolizes making God's message your own. Making it your own. You take it in for yourself so that when you speak, you are conveying the very words, the very message of God. John wasn't to come up with his own story. He was to repeat and reveal and communicate God's story and what God had communicated. Second observation, this, this eating of the scroll mirrors the, vac- the exact instruction given to the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. For those of you who know your Old Testament, I encourage you to read Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Ezekiel was also told to eat the scroll that he was given, which warned of God's impending judgment against Israel. The similarity, in fact, between John's assignment and Ezekiel's assignment is remarkable. Let me just share with you, and you can look at your outline. Both Ezekiel and John had a vision of God's glory. In Ezekiel's case, it was this platform, the throne room of God with wheels turning in every direction and four living creatures with faces in four different directions. Uh, Really a, a weird scene depicting the glory and power of God moving across the earth. Both had a vision of God's glory. John, it was the throne room of God, as if the curtain was pulled aside and he saw these four living creatures there before the throne of God. Second, both were instructed to give words of warning to a stubborn and obstinate people. In Ezekiel's case, it was Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Israel, who had walked away from God, drifted from God. Third, both were given a scroll containing warnings of coming judgment, coming lamentations, if you don't heed those warnings. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 10 brings that out. And then both John and Ezekiel were told to eat, that is, digest what they had been given. Chapter 3 of Ezekiel 1 through 3. This brings us to our third observation, that is, the result of eating this scroll is sweetness followed by bitterness. Sweetness followed by bitterness. The prophet Ezekiel also found eating the scroll that was offered to him sweet like honey. It tasted good. But John adds that it was upsetting his stomach. He needed Maalox or Pepto-Bismol or whatever it is that you use to calm your stomach. This means the message that he gave, though it was from God, was not pleasant. You know, folks, God's truth tastes sweet to us who heed it, to us who are called by God. But that doesn't mean that sometimes it's pleasant. Some of God's truths are hard to swallow, hard to stomach. Why? Because they, they upset us. Why? Because they involve suffering and misery and divine judgment to those who refuse to worship the Lamb. And that should never be something we delight in. It should upset us to think about, in Revelation, the coming calamity for humanity. And you might be thinking, well, I hope they get it. I know of a few politicians. I hope they get it. That's not the attitude we need to have. It should break our hearts for those who are far from God, who refuse to worship the Lamb and submit to God, in spite of all the warnings that God has given throughout history, to repent. So John is given this assignment by these angels. John was to be a voice of prophecy of God's coming judgment. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. It's the recording of his warning. And for 21 centuries now, think of all the generations of believers who have had the privilege and opportunity to read Revelation and read his warnings. The scope of John's warning is much wider than Ezekiel's warning. Ezekiel, in his warning, was basically aimed toward the Jewish people specifically, warning them to get right before it's too late, before God carries them off in judgment. But John's warning is to a much wider audience, a worldwide audience, and this leads us to the fourth observation. John's warning is for all people, all people who refuse to 
to worship the Lamb, Jesus Christ. In verse 11, John was told by the angels, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues, language groups, and even kings, even the rich and powerful, the elite, will not escape this judgment that is coming. They too will have to face the righteous judgment of God. You know, truly rich people, they want to separate themselves from the rest of us. And it's the security measure. When you have so much, you're afraid that somebody else will take it. And so they often live in, of course, gated communities, private enclaves, private islands. And yet, when Jesus comes and God's judgment takes place, his righteous execution of justice, there will be no place to hide, no place to run, even for the elite, the most powerful of this world, the kings of the earth. Now, folks, on another note, wouldn't it be great if those people who are in charge, think of our own country, think of worldwide, if those people are truly in positions of power today, if they they saw the light and repented, wouldn't it be great if they got right with Jesus? Wouldn't that be a hallelujah day? It would be. And we need to pray for our leaders, as Paul tells Timothy to do. Pray for those in power that they would see the light, that they would come to Jesus. But more than likely, it's not going to happen, at least for most of them. The hardness of heart, the addiction of power is so strong that they will continue to ignore God until it's too late. And that's sad. But even though that may not occur, God still gives warning, and he will continue to give warning. Every tragedy, every calamity in world Seen in the world scene is a warning by God. You can't do it on your own. You need me, God is saying. Turn to me. Don't forget the heart of God. He wants none to perish. That's our God. He wants all to repent. That's our God. That's why he warns. And that's why he sent prophets in the Old Testament. That's why he sent a prophet named John. That's why he sends preachers like me to proclaim the message and the warning. Repent. Get right with God before it's too late. So in chapter 10, John is being commissioned to be a prophet. Just like Ezekiel was a prophet to Israel in the Old Testament. But John's audience, as we said, was much larger. It involves people of every nation, people, and language group in the world. It involves the rich and powerful, the elite, the rulers. And it involves the poor and lowly, the hoi polloi, the common people, you and me. It involves anybody and everybody. And the message is this, God's judgment is coming. And we need to repent before it's too late. We must repent before it's too late. Now think of how people dismiss this. Think about how the world in general would scoff at this, laugh at this, and say, you're nuts. There's no judgment day coming. That's just an old foible, fable used by Christians of old to get us in line and scare us. Think of that. But don't you be one of those who ignore this warning. Maybe I'm speaking to you right here. you haven't put your trust in Jesus as your Savior, your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to do that. God really does exist. This world didn't come from nothing. It wasn't an accident. It was a part of his divine creation. He created us, and he has a purpose for us, and he has a redemptive plan centered in his son, Jesus Christ. That's why he came 2,000 years ago, and he's coming again. I think it's going to be perhaps within our generation. Wouldn't that be something? But judgment day is coming. That's what a just God does. There's got to be a day of accountability, a day of justice. And so if you haven't put your faith in Jesus, I want to encourage you and invite you to do that. There's no more important decision you can make than that one. All of eternity hangs in the balance. Let me say something here on this holiday week. There are not many pathways to heaven. Today, the common belief for many is that, oh, 
believe whatever you want, all roads lead to heaven. Not true. The Bible is very clear. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. That is why he said, I am the way. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, Jesus said. So don't be deceived by this world. We here proclaim Jesus with love, and we are a loving people, but also with truth. We speak the truth and with courage because it's going to take courage to speak that truth. But it's a day of repentance. Today is a day of salvation. If you haven't made that commitment, please accept Jesus into your life. Get on the right side of history. And all those who put their faith in Jesus are on the right side of history. Amen, folks? It's not because of us. It's because of who Jesus is. And let me just clarify real one thing, very important, because sometimes we get the message gets misconstrued. When I talk to LGB about the LGBTQ community and the movement, we as Christians do not hate anybody to, regardless of their lifestyle, regardless of their beliefs. We will treat every person we meet with kindness and dignity and respect. We may not agree, but we're going to treat you with love, dignity, and respect. But as far as the movement now that has just really taken over this world, it's not, you start out as Pride Day, then Pride Week, and now it's Pride Month. We just got through the month of June. And you know, pride is not a good, not a good message. The Bible hates, says that God hates pride. Pride is not a good virtue. And to have this being declared continually on TV and everywhere you go and on banners and posters, that's not good. we got a world that's rapidly being deceived and I believe led by demonic principalities and powers. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So we're not going to fear. and We aren't going to be intimidated. We're not going to be hateful. We're going to love everybody as individuals. We may be against movements that are trying to deceive, especially when it comes to our children and mislead them. We'll speak up for the truth, but we'll always do it in love. Amen, folks? That's what we need to be. Right now, Christians are being viewed often by many as a a hate group. No, just because you disagree doesn't mean you hate. Stand for something. Stand for something and stand for the truth that is found and revealed in God's Word. But don't forget God's heart. As I close here, God is not a God who delights in wiping people out. Don't think of that. God is not a God who delights in judgment. That's not his preference. That is not his favorite activity. Of course not. But judgment is necessary because God is just. He is love, but he is also just. And thank goodness he is both. So judgment day is coming. You can ignore me and disregard me. That's what they've done throughout history. But it's true. And it's coming. And I believe that as things unravel and conditions in our world go from bad to worse, and they are, there will be plenty of opportunities for us who know Jesus to proclaim Jesus with love and truth and courage. So look for those opportunities. There's a lot of misguided, hurting people, lost, confused, This is our opportunity. This is our time to let the light shine. Let our faith be known. Share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Like John was told to speak up, to be a witness, so you and I need to speak up and be a witness to testify about the hope and help and healing that is found only in Jesus. I want you to think for a moment as we close. Who comes to mind who right now that you know is far from God? or someone in your family, a co-worker, a friend at school, someone in our community, maybe a neighbor. Pray for them. Pray that their hearts would be open and they would see the truth, as it were, see the light and come to Jesus before it's too late. Let's pray as we've never prayed before for our world, for our loved ones for those who are right now far from God, that they would draw close to God and repent before it is too late. Let's bow our heads. Father, I pray right now that somehow this message would grab hold of our hearts. You're a God of love and mercy, and thank goodness you are. But you're a God of justice. You're patient. 
But one day that patience will come to an end. And because you're a God of justice, a day of just, justice will come. It's coming. Father, I pray that all of us here are getting our hearts right with you. That we're making up our minds that we're going to follow you. We're going to get to know you. We're going to get into your word. We need the armor of God as never before. There's so many voices of deception out there that want to lead us astray. Help us to stay centered in you. I pray right now your blessing and strength and courage and loving presence for each and every person here, wherever they go, as they have those conversations with their family members and neighbors and friends, as you give opportunity, help us to be good witnesses of the message of hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you. Father, I pray that all of us look forward to that day when the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes again. What a day that will be. We ask your blessing now in Jesus' name.